got our Bibles, Amen. and turn to Titus, Titus chapter number, well, I guess chapter number three, we'll go there, Titus in the Bible there, and yeah, good to have, uh, good to have everybody out here on Wednesday, I was looking for somebody, if we record already, I better not say anything else, all right, there's nothing that bad, nothing bad, of course, but. I always look for more people here, you know? <laughs> What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me here? I'd like to see more. But this is good tonight. Good, good number here. Good to have the faithful ones. I wonder, I wonder if the rapture is going to take place on Wednesday night. <laughs> <laughs> We'd all just disappear right from church. So get in your car, drive over here, get in the church, and go to heaven right from church. Wouldn't that be exciting, huh? All right. Titus chapter 3, talking about again, here we are, just about this, uh, there might be another Wednesday again, I'm not sure, on the back side, on the back side of the notes, make sure you have the notes too, please, make sure everybody has the notes, on the back side of the notes there, I'm kind of going back to Colossians chapter 4, where also, verses 4 to 17, there's introduction to a lot of people talking about certain people. And I think one of the main things we can learn from this is that churches are made up of all kinds of people doing all kinds of things. It's not just the Apostle Paul or the pastor of a church, but everybody's involved in different ways. And let's read first from Titus chapter 3, uh, beginning, just, yeah, beginning of verse 8. I want to begin in verse 8. Titus chapter 3, beginning of verse 8. says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly. Paul is saying, and I want to get the idea of this little phrase here. Uh, saying, and these things I will, that's what he wants them to do. Of course, he's motivated by the Lord. But these things I will that thou affirm constantly. And when he says I will, Paul had a certain authority. He had a, his authority from the Lord, but he had an authority where he could kind of can I say, boss people around. He could tell them because his authority came from the Lord. So therefore he had authority because the Lord gave him that authority. Just want to emphasize a little bit tonight. There is authority in the church. We're talking more about that in the Sunday school time too on Sunday mornings. But I will, and, and these things I will, that thou affirm constantly. Affirm means keep reminding the people about that constantly. And let them know this is the truth. This is real. It's important. That, now here it is. That they which have believed in God, Christians, might be careful to maintain good works. Works don't get you saved, but once you are saved, you should do good works for the Lord. Good works where you are. So be careful. Be careful. Be filled with care about this. That uh, to maintain good works. Uh, these things are good and profitable unto men. Uh, but avoid, now here's what not to do. Avoid foolish questions. Questions that really are foolish in the sense that they don't make sense. They're, you know, some people, I, you hear people ask certain questions sometimes, and you know they're not sincere questions. You know there's just not the right way. If they really were sincere about seeking the Lord, they wouldn't ask a question like that. Sometimes it shows up maybe their pride or something, but, but you can even sense those things in the kind of questions that people ask. Like some of the questions they ask the Lord were to tempt Him, not to learn from Him. So ask, avoid foolish questions. And so you have to know what foolish questions are to avoid them, first of all. So avoid foolish questions and genealogies, going back in the old thing over and over, and contentions and strivings about the law. Things that lead into a, an argument. Things that lead into a disagreement. You need to be careful about these things. Realize that sometimes people can be wrong on things, so don't get into an argument about it. Especially out there dealing with lost people too. We need, you need to show them Christian patience, and I, I know you do. Oh, contention strives about the law. For they are unprofitable and vain. Unprofitable. Some kind of questions that people ask dealing with even Bible issues, they're unprofitable. They're nothing, no good is gonna come of that. And they're vain. It's just they're empty. The word vain can be empty or the vain the word vain can refer to pride. So they are unprofitable and vain. Now, a man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, rejects. Some people you talk to a few times, and 
Well, we don't always know who the heretics really are. Uh, you don't always can understand it, but sometimes you deal with a few a people a few times, several times, and they're just they don't seem to want to get it, or they, they argue, they reject it, they get stubborn about it. Well, if you find people like that, well, just back off, just let them go their way for a while, because not everybody's going to get saved, not everybody's going to be sincere. Uh, now, verse eleven, knowing that he, this heretic, that is such, is subverted and sinned, be condemned of himself. You know, even if you don't know what verse number 11 means, it sounds serious, doesn't it? This person's in serious trouble. Those that really won't listen. Now, verse 12, when I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, here we go, starting with these four people, Artemis, Tychicus, Zenos, and Apollos are the four people here. Again, verse 12. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me, so when they get there, you come here, is what Paul is saying to Titus here. When, when they get to where you are, then you leave them and you come over to where I am. Be diligent to come unto me to the compass, for I am determined there to win. So a lot of practical decisions you have to make uh, of your own uh, thoughts about things. You're not going to have any special kind of leadership, for I am de determined there to win. I've made this decision, a wise decision. I'm going to spend the winter there at Nicopolis, so I want you there with me when I'm there, so we can minister and do all the works there. Now, verse 13. Bring Zenos the lawyer, and again, he was not a political lawyer in that sense, but he was a spiritual lawyer, the law of the Lord. So bring Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them, and others provide for what they need. And then verse 14, and let us also learn to maintain good works for necessary, necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. You need to uh, provide for people's practical needs. And that's one of the things that a lot of the missionaries have all the time, practical needs. And we can help them with their practical needs. Quick question, what are practical needs? Food, clothing, a place to stay, shelter, place to live. All these things are needed, aren't they? Sometimes even medical care. Sometimes a new car or a different car, a better car or a new car. But be not unfruitful. Now verse 15, as it closes out. All that are with me salute, salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. It says again, greet them that love us in the faith. Let's look at the notes here. On the front side of the notes, about two-thirds there, you see the four different names there. Art, Artemis, Tychicus, Zenos, and Apollos. Turn back, if you would, now to Acts chapter 18, verse 24. This is where we left off last week. I'm going to kind of pick up here and talk about, re-emphasize it a little bit. Then we'll get into the next part here. But Acts chapter 18, and verse 24. Oh, uh, Acts, Acts, eight, oh, Acts 18, verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos. Oh, by the way, what I want you to do is think about how they talk, how they describe Apollos. The good things about him, and he has no bad things listed here, but he, he has some things uh, that he still needs to improve on, he needs to improve on. So think about that. But notice all the good things that are listed about him. This really impressed me when I, I read this little biography of his here. It's almost like when the Christian passes away, and then, then uh, in their eulogy at the funeral service, at the, at the service itself, a lot of times, they'll talk about the person, the people go up there and talk about the person, and they'll give a eulogy. And this is not a eulogy because he's passed away, but it talks about him, how he, uh, what his strengths are, and a little bit what his weakness is, too, some of the things he needs to improve in. But think about that. How would people talk about you? What would they say about you when you're gone? When you're gone. Here's what they talked about Apollos here. And a certain Jew named Apollos, okay, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, eloquent, to be eloquent in the way we talk. That's a good thing. Today, people just grumble, they mumble when they talk, they, they, you know, they, they, can't, they can't speak a whole sentence, you know, you know, they can't speak that well. But here, Apollos was talked about as being an eloquent man. 
Some of that speaks well, speaks well. And mighty in the scriptures, he really knew the Bible. Amen. Mighty in scriptures, really knew the Bible. Mighty in scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord. He had teaching about how to follow the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. There's another good quality, fervent in the spirit. He got excited about spiritual things. He was strong in this way. He was faithful in these kind of things. This is quite a man here, isn't he? Quite a Christian here. An eloquent man. Yeah. Was able to talk well. Eloquent. Mighty in the scriptures. Really knew the Bible. And this man instructed in the way of the Lord. He knew what was right. He knew what was wrong. Instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in the spirit. He had enthusiasm about it. Fervent, fervency. Fervent in the spirit. Uh, he spake and taught diligently. He, had a dil he spake diligently, faithfully, strongly, with confidence, with boldness, diligent. This was quite a guy. This was quite a Christian, wasn't he? And spake diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Kind of interesting. John the Baptist, uh, he was baptized under John the Baptist ministry. Now, verse 26. And he began to speak boldly, I like that, and where, where did he speak boldly? In the synagogue. Uh, who, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. He still needed to have some teaching done. He still needed to learn some things yet. But even before he, uh, before the end of verse number 26, look at all the good things were talked about here. He was uh, eloquent, mighty in the spirit, or spirit, fervent, he had a fervency about him, diligent about things. Yeah. Boldly, speak boldly. What a, I, I'd sure like to meet this guy uh, in our church. <laughs> Not, imagine if he could come back from heaven for a little, just a little while and be in our church. I'd like to meet this guy who's eloquent, mighty, fervent, diligent, and bold. And yet he still needs to learn a few things too. I find that a very curious thought. They added that in at the, at the end there, where Quill and Priscilla need to talk to him a little bit, explain a few things he still didn't have quite right. Kind of, he say, tweak his, uh, his Christianity there. But what a guy. What a guy. I wonder what they're going to say about us. You know, we, maybe if the, the time comes when we pass away and the rapture hasn't taken place yet and we, we have a funeral service, what do they say about us? What do they say about us? Eloquent, mighty, fervent, diligent, bold for the Lord. What great qualities this man had. All right, let's, I'm going to, well, let's see. Titus chapter 3, verse 8, we dealt with that already. Right. Let's go on the back side of the notes now and turn to Colossians chapter 4. And Colossians, on the back side of the notes in Colossians chapter 4. I, I've always liked doing this, making questions, looking at the verse and, and coming up with questions. And so Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 7, is similar to the end of Titus because it talks about certain individuals and, and their qualities, certain, certain things. And one of the things this really shows me is that in each of these churches, there are a lot of people involved in different things. Paul had a lot of contacts, dealt with a lot of people. And so there needs to be a lot of people working in different churches, not just one person doing everything. Even the Apostle Paul had his helpers and needed others to work with him. Uh, at the bottom part, of the, I'm on the back side of the notes now, about halfway down, and we'll get back to Colossians chapter 4 in just a minute, about halfway down on the back side, it says, why the need for helpers or co-workers and friends in Christian work? Why? Why do we need others working together? There are some people, people kind of at home, Lone Ranger Christians, uh, they don't want to serve the Lord by themselves, they don't want to be in a church involved anywhere, or have other people helping them. You know, be careful that that's not biblical. Right. So why the need for helpers, co-workers, and friends in Christian work? I came up with ten different thoughts, and these are my thoughts, maybe not the most eloquent, <laughs> but ten different thoughts I had about this. Why we need to work together, Christians. Why we need to get work together. Number one, no one can do everything themselves. You know, in Romans, was it chapter 12 there? It talks about different people have different gifts. Not everybody's the eye, not everybody's the ear, not everybody's the, the mouth. You know, there are different gifts, different ways that we serve. So we, to make up a, a whole body, there has to be all kinds of different people doing different things in the church. They have a full spiritual body in a church. So no one can do everything themselves. I made that mistake many, many years ago, <laughs> kind of, just kind of humorously. I was 
talking to our young church and their young Christians there, and, and just talk, I said, I, you know, I can do it. I can do it all. I told them, I can do it all. I can do song leading. I can uh, serve as an usher. I can preach. I can teach. I can sing. I can, I can, do, I can do it all. They, they all thought that was kind of funny. They never let me live that down. When I said, I can do it all. But it's not the way it's to be done in the church. Now, sometimes somebody has to do more than one job, of course. But no one can do everything themselves. We're not going to accomplish that much if we just try to do everything by ourselves. Everything for ourselves. Number two, Christians need the fellowship of other Christians. Sometimes even I, I come here, I'm kind of tired and dragging a little bit. And I walk in here and people start to talk to me. You cheer me up. You know, did you know that? You cheer me up. You wake me up. That's a big thing too. You wake me up when I come in. And that's a good, that's needed by the pastor. He needs to be awake when he's preaching. He needs to be awake when he's teaching. We need each other, Christian. It's, we're going to be, uh, how do I say this? We're, we're not going to be as effective. We're not going to be on fire ourselves. We're not going to be revived all by ourselves. We need other people. We need other Christians for fellowship. Even the Lord Jesus Christ had his disciples. The Apostle Paul, we're reading here in different books in the Bible, how many people he had with him all the time. And he wants sometimes, he'd uh, tell somebody to go somewhere, but he wanted others to come with him. He didn't like being alone. There was one time when all men forsook me. I pray God not be laid to their charge. Not to send the Lord to it with me and strengthen me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, fully known all the Gentiles might hear. And I will deliver out of the mouth of the lion. The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom and to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So there was a time when Paul was by himself, but he didn't like it. He, that's not what he preferred to do. Christians need the fellowship of other Christians. Number three, Christians draw closer together when they work together. You know? Just putting on the labels with the newsletters. You know, they, you gotta have a little fellowship back. You put on the labels, get together, work out, do this, do that, you know. It, it draws people closer together when they do things together. Do things together. Uh, number four, for comfort. Since we're in Colossians, turn to Colossians chapter four, verse 11. Look at verse 11 here. And Jesus, which is called justice, so it wasn't Jesus Christ here, but somebody else with the same name. And Jesus, which is called just, who are the circumcision, they're Jewish. They, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Comfort, who's the me there? Well, the me is the writer of Colossians. And who's the writer of Colossians? The Apostle Paul. They've been a comfort unto me. Again, verse 11. And Jesus, which is called justice, who are the circumcision. These only are my fellow workers. In other words, he didn't have as many with him as he did other times. These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God. That's what our work is. Which have been a comfort, a comfort unto me. So other Christians can be a comfort, a help, uh, when you're going through difficult times. Number five. There is a work to do. Well, let's back up to Philippians. Don't lose Colossians. We'll be back there. But Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. There's a work to do. Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. is one of those places where it talks about, uh, Paul referred to some of the people that worked with him, and some of the ladies here in particular. Philippians chapter 4, verse 3 says, And I entreat thee also to your, your fellow, because Christianity is certainly the Lord is a job. It's a yoke. It's a burden put on us. It's a yoke. Uh, to your fellow. Help those women which labor with me in the gospel. Certain ladies that have been a special help in some way, working with the gospel, getting on tracks, whatever it was. But help those women which labor with me in the gospel. With Clement also, another one. See, Paul didn't forget those who helped him. Those, Paul did not forget those who were his yoke fellows that worked with him. Paul had a lot of good memories, a lot of good memories of people that helped him. And he didn't forget that. And here they are even in Scripture. The Holy Spirit of God led Paul to talk about that even in the writings here, even in the Bible. In the Gospel with Clement also. And with other my fellow laborers, there's others too, other more fellow laborers worked along with me whose names are in the book of life. 
They're going to be remembered for this in particular too. Rejoice in the Lord always again and say rejoice. But talked about different individuals. So back to the notes. Number five. There is a work to do for fellow laborers, yoke fellows. It's a job to do to serve the Lord here. And there's a lot of parallels to working for the Lord and working a regular job too. There's a lot of parallels. You have to get up at times out of bed in the morning uh, to serve the Lord. To go to work, come out and serve the Lord. You have to be at a certain place, certain location. Uh, there's a starting time for church, starting time for Bible study, just like there's a starting time for jobs. And it does weary you. Be not weary in well doing, as the Bible says. Serving the Lord will make you tired too, just like a job will make you tired. There's a parallel there. Don't think Christian Christianity is going to be easier. It's just better and more joyous. Yeah. Has a greater purpose than any other kind of job. But there's a work to do. Fellow laborers, yoke fellows. It's a job, it's a work. All right, number six on my list here. No, there is always a need for more helpers than bosses. Let, the, let that sink in. Uh, on the job, how many bosses are there? One, how many workers are there? Could be, could be a lot. Could be four or five, could be 20, 30. There's only need for one boss, but we need a lot of workers by comparison in numbers. We need a whole lot more workers than we need bosses. <laughs> Number seven, some Christian work cannot be accomplished by only one person. That's probably more of a repetitious thing I said already. Number eight, Christians have physical needs as well as spiritual needs. The practical needs, the physical needs, uh, food, clothing, shelter, those kind of things. Yeah, Christians need those too. Missionaries need those too. Number nine, I don't know if you've heard of this word. I, a number of years ago, I talked about it some. Synergy. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands to see who knows what synergy means and those who don't. So let me just read the definition here. Synergy, because this is how we need to work as Christians. Synergy is the interaction or cooperation of two or more organizations, substances, or other agents, meaning people, agents, people, to produce a combined effort greater than some of their separate effects. So people working together will accomplish more than people working separately by themselves, is what synergy means. And that's why, that's why we have a church today. That's why we have a church. Because people working together will accomplish more, will accomplish more than individual people working by themselves. Their individual effort, if you count them up, they're not as much as people working together are. Combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. That's one of the reasons for the church. People working together in the church. Different jobs, different ministries in the church. Synergy. Synergy. And then number 10. The local New Testament church is to be a place for worship, ministry, evangelism. Do the work of the evangelist. We do it out there in the world too, in the city, but we also do evangelism yeah. in the church sometimes. Do the work of the evangelist, evangelist and work. So what is the church for? It's being place for worship. Can we really worship the Lord, to learn about Him, and sing these songs and glorify the Lord? Ministry, we minister in different areas where God has given us those gifts and talents. Evangelism, getting out the gospel, the real gospel. And work, just plain old work. It takes work, 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 work. I am looking at the bushes outside. I don't have as much energy. I love working in the churchyard, you know that. I love pulling weeds, I love doing, uh, I see kind of some jobs that need to be done. I might be here tomorrow working in the yard. I don't want you here. I, I can do work by myself. I, <laughs> there we go. Anyways, uh, work, it's all part of it. What do we come to church for? It's worship, ministry, evangelism, and work. Those four things, those four things. All right. If you need to work together, I don't know. Okay. Now turn to Colossians chapter 4. Turn back to Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. All right. Begin reading verse 7. The same idea here that's at the end of Titus. Talking about some individuals and what they've done. And remember, these individuals were written in the Bible, the Word of God. The inspired Word of God names these people. I think that's pretty special. Uh, Ephesians chapter again, 4, verse 7. 
says, And all my state shall Tychicus, now there's a name we ran across, declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant serving in the Lord. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. So Tychicus was sent there to, to Colossae with Onesimus, a faithful beloved brother, who was one of you, who shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. You know, when Paul was in jail, he didn't stop witnessing, did he? He went to still his other prisoners too. And here's one that got saved. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salute you. And Marcus, my sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom he received commandments. If he come unto you, receive him, Barnabas. And Jesus, which is called Justice. I think we ran across him tonight already, didn't we? Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision. These only are my fellow servants unto whom the King of God, which have been a comfort unto me, like we read earlier. Now verse 12. Epaphras, uh, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that he may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you. A great zeal for you. The fellowship there, the saints there, he has a great zeal for you. And them that are in Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis, Luke the beloved physician and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren, salute the brethren, which are at Laodicea and Nymphos and the church, the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, I cause it to be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that he likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received of the Lord, that thou fulfill it, the salutation of my the hand of Paul. Remember my bonds, bonds, he's in jail. Grace be with you, amen. I just want to talk about this last part. And he talks about all these people again. How many times does the Paul do this? When he gets ready to close out one of these letters, he names a lot of people. Now, on the back side of the notes, we'll have time to go over a few of these questions, but maybe not all of them. Uh, at the top of the back side, the notes at the top of the back side says, another similar reference more extended recognition of others in the ministry are given in Colossians 4, 7 to 17, which we just read. The question is real quick. Number one, how many men are mentioned in Colossians 4, 7 to 17? Kind of the whole Bible said you want. Anybody, anybody do these questions? Does anybody have an answer there? Yeah. Not, there weren't quite that many. It wasn't quite that many. I think, it was, you know, honestly, I didn't fill in the answers myself in my copy. I believe it was six, if I remember right, now, I think. But you uh, read them over. Number two, who was the one that was to comfort your hearts towards Paul's situation? Yeah, who was the one that we read that verse, didn't we? Was it comfort unto me in verse 11? Jesus, not Jesus Christ, someone with the same name, which is called Justice, though, who are the circumcision, had been a, have been a comfort. These only are my fellow servants unto the King of God, which have been a comfort unto me. So more than one, but him in particular, too. So Paul wrote down those that were comforting him. We can learn a lesson there, I think, too, to comfort each other. Make that as one of our goals. One of the, I think one of the best ways we can comfort another person is pray for them. Pray for them. Remember their needs and pray for them. Have a heart for the other people and the different things they're going through. It's so difficult, so difficult sometimes. Christians don't have an easy life all the time, do we? No. All right, so the one to comfort hearts towards Paul's situation. Number three, what interesting relationship did Paul have with Aristarchus? What do they call him? My fellow prisoner. Prisoner. Uh, let's see, what, I forget what verse that was in. There is verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. Prisoner. Like I said earlier, even when Paul was in jail. Christian, no matter where you are, witness to people. Bring up about the Lord, no matter where you are. My fellow prisoners saluted you. So Aristarchus, he was in jail with the Apostle Paul. In jail with the Apostle Paul there. So no matter where we are, we can witness. And it wasn't like down in Key West, Florida, when we did jail visitation. After an hour, they didn't leave the jail. I left the jail. And the ones that were witnessing to them left. But they stayed there. They have to live there. What a, what a life. Huh? All right, number four. 
Number four, Epaphras was given the longest number of accommodations and references in verse 12 and 13. How many and which ones do you find? Let's read those verses over again. Verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, that's one, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently. Now there's a ministry for Christians. Always laboring fervently. Always working with enthusiasm, fervently. For you in, ah, in prayers, that's one of the ways he fervently uh, worked for them. In prayers, pray for people that ye may stand perfect, complete in all the will of God. All the will of God. To find out what the Lord would have for us. I, I guess I can say this. Perfection for a Christian is impossible. But we're to strive for perfection. We're to strive to be the best we can for the Lord. To work at it, to be aware of it. So he was one that was striving in that sense. That he may stand perfect, complete in all the will of God. But we are to be a servant of Christ, salute you, labor fervently, fervently. Look at verse 13. For I bear him, him record. This is true about him. Paul says, I can tell you this, this truth about this man. I can bear him record. Here's what's true about him. That he had a great zeal for you. Zealousness. You, you can tell about, a lot about a people but what gets them excited. You can tell a lot about a person what they get most ex excited about and, and zealous about. About doing some people get excited about the wrong things, don't they? You really ought to get excited, most excited about serving the Lord. So you have here, and a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis. So all these different places. He had a zeal. All right, let me ask you. What does that mean? What does it mean to have a zeal for somebody? And what does zealousness lead to? If you're really zealous about something, you have a zeal for somebody, you're concerned about them, you care about them, you will provide for them, you will pray for them. If you really have a zeal for people, it's zeal for people in our church, zeal for other Christians, zeal for the pastors, zeal for other people in the church, everybody, to have a zealousness for them, not to just be negligent about uh, what they're going through and their difficulties and their heartaches, but have a zeal. What does that mean to you? What does that mean to have a, a zeal for somebody? Yeah, it means you care about them. And you want to do something for them. Of course, you pray for them. That's probably one of the easier things to do. And let me tell you something. I was thinking about, I saw something today. And yeah, I think it was one of the Christian papers that said, America needs, now, don't say men. No, be careful, because I'm, I'm going to say something else here. America needs prayer. I'm thinking, no, America needs repentance. Yeah. That's America. You can pray and pray, but here, not, you don't have the zealousness you need for the Lord and for the Lord's house and for the, the people of the Lord, the work of the Lord, getting out the gospel. If you don't have a zeal for that, your prayers, it says a fervent prayer, a fervent prayer is the kind that God listens to. A fervent prayer is the kind that God uh, will hear, hear and answer. So, yeah, America needs prayer, and we need to pray for America. But I think what we need more is America needs repentance. Amen. Christians need to get on fire. They need to be zealously affected about our nation, too. Zealously affected. All right, let's go on here now in the notes. So, again, number, number five, uh, who was it that perhaps the longest, uh, perhaps the longest with the Apostle Paul, is that is still with him at this time? That's kind of interesting. Verse 14. Who was it that was perhaps the longest with the Apostle Paul? And who was that? Dr. Luke. Yeah. Look at verse 14 there. Luke, the, not just the doctor, the beloved physician. <laughs> Do you love your doctor? You know, I, I don't always love my doctor. Because every time it seems like I go in there, they give me some bad news. Like you need a shot, or you need this, or whatever. But it was, but Luke, because he dealt with the spiritual things with Paul, there he's still there. Luke wrote a couple of books in the Bible, didn't he? Yeah. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas. Demas, another one. Demas is a curious guy, isn't he? What happened to Demas? Demas had fled, led, or fled, yeah, fled the apostle Paul. 
Demas hath forsaken me. Do you know how that verse ends? There it is. Demas hath forsaken me. Are we talking about the same Demas here in verse 14? Yeah. yeah. Demas hath forsaken me. So this, of course, was before he forsook him. Having loved this present world. Ah, be careful. Be careful there. Demas, Luke the beloved physician, but Demas also greet you. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Yeah, be careful when this love tries to vie for your affections. When you start to love the things in this world more than you love God. Now we need to, we understand that there's a, there's a need for things in this world. But we need to love the Lord most, more than anything in this world. Well, there's those verses, aren't they? He that loveth father and mother more than me. So it's saying you should love your father and mother and your family. But if you love them more than the Lord, there's a problem there. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth what? Son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So it's important to make sure you love the Lord the most. You need to love the family in this world. You need to care about them, of course. But the Lord's got to be your, your first love, your strongest love in this world. And let, let me say this. There will be times in your life when that love will be tested. There will come times in your life when the priorities, the priorities of your love will be tested. Who you will love the most, love the Lord the most, or love something in this world more than the Lord. Uh, important, important, isn't it? To make sure you have your, your love prioritized, what you love the most. Now the Lord should be number one because he deserves it. Nobody has done more for you than us, than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Nobody's ever died for me like that, especially the King of Glory, coming down from heaven, who died for me. Nobody's done that, anything greater for me than that. That's one of the reasons, among many, he should be loved the, the most in our lives. Yeah, we need to care about our family, of course. He that loveth the Father and Mother more than me. We need to love our, our parents and our children, our family. But we need to love the Lord the most. That's important. All right, number six again. Who was it perhaps the longest? Uh, Luke. And number six, who was mentioned for a good reason again? 2 Timothy 4.10, that was Demas. Demas had forsaken me, had to love this present world. Demas. And then what admonitions give to Archippus in, in, in verse 17? <clears throat> what admonition? We'll close with this tonight. Verse 17. And say to our Archippus, take heed, take heed, be warned about this, to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Follow through. Uh, Pastor John, last Sunday night, we were talking a little bit uh, ahead of time, and afterwards, too, and even during the message, I think he mentioned it once, about he says he wants to fulfill his ministry. He wants to, he doesn't want to quit. He wants to keep on going. And that's a good, good admonition, and that's the one talked about right here, for this one man, that thou fulfill it. Take heed to the ministry. Why? That thou fulfill it. Take heed to the ministry. Be aware of your ministry, how you serve the Lord, to fulfill it. Don't stop. Don't quit. Stay at it. Stay faithful. And I'll tell you this, Christian, you'll never regret it. Someday we'll stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, and if we've heard them, we'll hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I'm getting chills just thinking about that. That's really going to happen. It's really going to happen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word that excites us and motivates us and renews us and revives us. Thank you, Lord, for that. I pray that you'll bless the work in each one of our hearts now. Yes. Give us your blessing, your help, your encouragement. And Lord, there are times we need comfort. I think some of the people on the prayer list earlier uh, that was one of their needs. Some of those people's yeah. needs comfort, comfort, need help to be comforted, to be encouraged. So we pray for them. And then again, Lord, I just pray your work in our lives and help us to fulfill that admonition that we will 
follow through. We will follow through and not give up and not quit. So thank you, Lord, for this time. Someday we'll rejoice in heaven, but Lord, I want to be able to rejoice right here now, too, to enjoy my salvation, to enjoy serving you, serving you in such a special and important way. So thank you, Lord, for our church. Thank you for all the people in our church. And I pray that you bless now as we are dismissed, too. In Jesus' name, we pray and ask these things. Amen.